All good? Welcome. <laughs> Very formal, so yeah, don't worry. Uh, so my name's Emma, and I'm one of the I'm the fossil fish curator at the Natural History Museum in London, and I'm a paleoichthologist, which is basically a fancy word for st someone who studies very old dead fish. So I've been asked to come along today and talk a little bit about uh, fossils, uh, pa work in paleontology, and also in celebration of International Women's Day, a little bit about my experience of being a female paleontologist working in the industry today. So I thought I'd start off with, so I've got my, um, my nickname is actually Paleo Barbie, and I've got my own Paleo Barbie doll here with me, um, see it on the screen as well. And uh, this is actually part of my office. So lots of people actually come past my office because I've got lots of pink dinosaurs, um, lots of uh, cuddly toy sharks and things as well. So obviously a very serious, um, you know, uh, office as well. But you've got, to, you've got to have some fun at work. But anyway, so um, yes, yeah, so we're just going to be talking a little bit about, so what is a fossil? How does, how does something become a fossil, like a dinosaur? How do we know about dinosaurs? Um, some of the female paleontologists that have helped influence uh, me today, so people like Mary Anning, for example. Um, why am I actually called Paleo Barbie? And then also a little bit about why different places that you can actually go and find your own fossils. So what does a paleontologist look like? I'm, I'm often approached by people and they tell me, you don't look like a paleontologist. You don't, and especially you don't look like a paleontologist that does field work. And I guess, um, so there was one time this happened to me, and I was at an outreach event. I'd been chatting to a father and son for a good 10, 15 minutes, and all about different fossils, lots of questions. And um, at the end, the dad said, oh, that's great. You know, you seem really knowledgeable, but um, you know, my son here, he really wants to speak to a real paleontologist, can he? So I just turned around and said, well, actually you have been. Um, I am a real paleontologist, you can pinch me, I am alive. Um, and he just sort of went, oh, oh, oh sorry, sorry. Um, so I thought, actually, I'm gonna turn this around. What do you think a paleontologist looks like? And he actually turned around and one of my colleagues, older man, big white bushy beard, leather elbow patches and sort of said to him, and I was like, actually, yeah, to be fair, that is the sort of stereotypical image of a paleontologist. And um, I would like to sort of challenge that perception um, of that. So that's kind of like where the uh, nickname Paleo Barbie sort of um, came from. So kind of keep that in your mind, you know, like what does a paleontologist look like? I don't think there is a specific, you know, group or look that a paleontologist has. Because um, I don't think many people would assume me, saw me walking down the street, that I was a paleontologist. But that's fine. So, this is me, um, if this was a David Attenborough documentary in my natural habitat. So, at work, I'm responsible for about 100,000 fossils. So, I need to know what they are, where they came from, how old they are. Um, so, I also work with lots of different researchers all around the world and basically help them do their homework. So sometimes I can be measuring different fossils, I can be taking pictures, I can be firing lasers at fossils to look at the inside of them, uh, lots of different things. So that's me doing some laser scanning there. Um, I'm very fortunate and I get to travel the world and dig up fossils for a living. So this is me um, in Wyoming in America digging up fossil dinosaurs. Yep, so I've dug, uh, dug up um, big sauropods similar to Dippy downstairs. How many people would like to do that? Yeah, that's pretty fun, yeah. Um, I also um, put together exhibitions, both inside the Natural History Museum in London and other museums around the UK. Um, this is me actually in a cave in Morocco, digging up a big shark. So each one of those little circles that you can see there is a vertebrae, so part of the spine of a shark that was about 10 metres in length. Uh, so I actually work on fossil sharks, that's part of my research interest. So I basically want to know why, uh, how did they evolve, why did they go, some of them go extinct, and why did some of them survive? Often looking at past climates to basically help us predict what might happen in the future. Because basically if you go back through all of geological time, lots of different things have happened, and help us to make predictions, we can then look at the past, look to see what happened, and then that can help us make educated assumptions of what will then happen in the future um, if the planet continues to heat up in the way that it is. So other things that I do is, oh, 
oh, wrong button, sorry. Right. Um, is doing outreach events like this, so speaking to people like your good selves, all about the work that we do at the museum um, and other things, going to conferences, um, driving the occasional forklift truck because the fossils are pretty heavy uh, to get moving around. Um, and I've also done quite a lot of press um, around different um, excavations that we've worked, um, done, research um, and other things like that. And I've been a consulting on a couple of TV programmes um, as well, which is quite exciting. Uh, but most of the time, actually, I would say most, uh, most of my work is involving emails and meetings, so the same as any other job. Um, but if it is getting a bit boring, then I can go out and I've got fantastic fossils that I can get to play around with. But anyway, so starting off with, so a little bit about me. So who, who really likes dinosaurs? Yeah, I think there's a few dinosaur fans in the audience. I see some people, yeah, a few adults as well, yeah. So when I was your age, ever since I was really little, I always wanted to work with dinosaurs. I thought they were amazing animals, and I wanted to know what they were, and why did they get so big? Why did they look the way that they did? And then I realised, as I got a bit older, that you could actually do that as a job, which was pretty cool. Um, and there was all this other stuff as well. So I decided that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a paleontologist. Um, so I went to university, did a couple of um, different degrees. And when I was doing my undergraduate degree at Glasgow, I, that was my first taste behind, um, working behind the scenes at a museum. So all the things that you see on display is only a tiny fraction of what museums have in their stores that most people don't normally get to see. And I thought this was absolutely fascinating. I thought this was amazing to have access to all these fantastic fossils. So it was at that point I thought, do you know what, working in a museum would be a fantastic opportunity. So I've done lots of different things. I've worked in a few different museums. Um, one summer I spent six, uh, three months in a, basically a metal shed. Um, so it was very, very hot. And we were remounting um, some ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs at the Yorkshire Museum, which is where I used to work. Uh, so this is us helping to remount one of these large marine reptiles that we're going to be learning a little bit more about um, in a couple of minutes. Um, again, putting together different exhibitions, outreach events, doing field work. Um, this is me when I was about five years old on a beach trying to find some fossils. Um, and then I've written some books, um, published papers, given talks about sharks and fossils and stuff in general. So anyway, enough about me. What is a fossil? So I get that a lot. So most of the time when people think about fossils, they'll probably think about some of these. Yeah, so imagine a fossil. Often it's a dinosaur bone. So this is me next to a sauropod um, leg bone. So like Dippy downstairs, so pretty big dinosaurs. We've got some shark's teeth, uh, brachiopods, so shells basically, coral, fish, ammonites, and trilobites. And we've got some of these fossils at the side here that um, I think you're welcome to go up and have a look at the end of the talk. So those are what we call body fossils. So these are typically hard um, bits of bone and um, teeth. So they're much more likely to fossilize. Other types of fossils are things like soft, uh, soft tissue you might get preserved. It's quite rare. Um, but if you get the right type of preservation, you can get things like ink sacs preserved from squids and octopus. You've got the arms, the tentacles, squid and octopus there. And um, this is Archaeopteryx, a very famous fossil. Um, one of the early birds, and it's how we know that um, uh, dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. So this is Archaeopteryx here, and we've got these feathers that have been preserved. Uh, sharks, we have cartilage preserved, so if you give our ears a bit of a wiggle, yeah, can you wiggle your nose? So that's cartilage, and that's what a shark skeleton is composed of, it's cartilage, this soft tissue. Um, if you try and wiggle your bone in the middle of your arm, you can't do it because it's hard. Um, so again, that's one of the reasons why cartilage is much, um, isn't so likely to fossilise. And again, things like um, seeds and leaves and things from plants as well. Other types of fossils that, again, we think of are trace fossils. It's basically evidence of past life. So whether that be burrows, so here, these like white squiggly lines that you can see are actually burrows of little worms that have crawled into the sediment and um, that white is basically different sediment that's infilled it. 
and then it's um, sort of turned to stone. So we've got the traces, uh, we've got egg cases. So this is a shark egg case that we have here. We've got some eggs there, uh, dinosaur footprints. That's quite, um, again, quite iconic. And again, looking at all these different fossils, we can start to work out, well, were, was the animal walking on two legs or four legs? Were they running? Were they walking in packs or just by themselves? Um, also with coprolites, or basically fossilised poo. Um, here are these little black blobs that you can see. These are different scales and bones. So again, these coprolites, we can then work out what these ancient animals were eating by looking at their poo. Um, so there's lots of different things that we can then use to build up this bigger picture of how all the different animals were interacting with each other, what did the landscape look like, um, who was hunting who, and why some of them might have actually died. So, talking about fossils in time, and it's quite difficult to get your head around, but I think this image kind of helps. So imagine a clock. So we're going to start um, at 12 o'clock, and we're going to go all, you've got to go all the way around uh, to about uh, 10 o'clock, nearly 10 o'clock, before the first animals evolved. So imagine 10 hours, no life. You've got to go all the way for 10 hours, basically, until the first animals um, and plants started to evolve. Dinosaurs, we think of being quite old fossils, and they are. Um, but on our clock there, they only evolved about 25 past 11. So over 11 hours before you had the first dinosaurs, they were coming all the way around uh, the clock there. So that was about 230 million years ago. And then humans, you and I, we only evolved literally a few seconds before we go back to 12 o'clock again. Yeah, so it's quite difficult to get your head around, but we're talking lots of millions of years ago. And so how something um, with the fossilization process, as I said, some things fossilize, other things don't so much. And there are biases in the fossil record. So as I said, it's mostly the hard parts that tend to fossilise. So if you think about it, when something dies, other animals might come in and eat all the soft, squishy parts. Even bacteria can come in and eat all the soft, squishy bits. Um, it might get eroded away. So like lots of wind and water blowing things around, they'll get all scattered around. Um, but ideally, if something gets buried very quickly, we're much more likely to get that um, preserved. Um, not everything fossilises, so we're only ever going to find a small percentage of past life. And the more areas that we go around searching for fossils, the more we help kind of basically build up this bigger picture. Um, oh yeah, and the fossils are typically only ever found in sedimentary rock. So things like sandstone, mudstone. So we've got quite a good example here. So we've got lots of these little lines, and those are all very small layers um, of rock. And in between some of these rock layers, I was able to find some fossil fish um, that were found in there. So imagine a book. So each sheet of paper is a different age of rock piled up on top of each other. And then occasionally between those pages, you sometimes get a fossil or an animal or plant that's been preserved. So how does something become a fossil? So I've sort of touched upon this. So the fossilization process, so we've got our ichthyosaur. And again, we're going to be coming back to talk about ichthyosaurs in just a second. So it's a large marine reptile that lived during the uh, Jurassic uh, period. There's an ichthyosaur sc um, skull downstairs that you'll be able to go and see as well. So our ichthyosaur dies for some reason. It might have been got a bit too old, apart, and maybe it was ill, or maybe it was killed by something else. But it dies, and then it falls down to the bottom of the sea. Um, it might get scavenged by other animals, or ideally, as I said, it would get buried very quickly with other sand and mud and other things piling on top of it. Um, as more and more it gets piled up, different water will start to seep through the different layers of sediment, and then it basically forms this chemical soup. And if you get the right sort of chemical soup, you, this is when you start to get the fossils that will become preserved. And then over millions of years, sometimes hundreds of millions of years, that rock layer will get brought up to the surface, it'll get brought back down, the rock will be eroded away. Think about um, the cliffs falling down at the beach, the constant hit of tides, that type of thing. Then people like myself, or even you guys, you can all go out there fossil hunting, and you might find a little bit of that fossil sticking up at the top of the ground. 
Um, it definitely beats going to the gym, because often you actually have to dig and excavate for weeks uh, sometimes in order to get to that right level. Um, and then, after quite a lot of painstaking work, you can find your own fossil. So this is the skull of an ichthyosaur um, here. So that's very sort of simplified there. Um, so mentioning ichthyosaurs, and um, actually it's very appropriate, I sort of thought I would talk a little bit about uh, one of the, my female heroines um, of paleontology. Uh, some of you might have heard of her. She's called Mary Anning. Yeah? Anybody heard about, of Mary Anning? Yeah. Some people have. Yeah, other people not. That's fine. Uh, so it's actually quite appropriate. So today is the 177th anniversary of her death. Um, and Mary Anning was born in 19, uh, sorry, uh, 1799. Um, and she was born to quite a poor family down in Lyme Regis in Dorset. Um, so this is her here um, with one of her dogs. Um, she, um, her father unfortunately died when she was just 11 years old. And this was at a time um, where there was a lot of poverty, lots of poor, uh, poorness. So her family really struggled. So her and her older brother would go out and collect fossils and, and sell them to some of the local tourists. And then over the years, uh, Mary Annan built up this reputation as a sort of go-to person uh, for tourists to go and pick up, like, uh, buy little fossils from her, but also for a lot of scientists. And they were all male at this time, basically, at this time. Um, and they would go look at her fossils and actually um, go to her for advice. Because over those years, Mary Annan built up a reputation as a sort of go-to person um, to discuss some of her finds. Um, I'm going to go on to a couple of the different fo uh, famous fossils that she found. But I mentioned coprolites earlier, and this is one of the coprolites. So these little black bits, as I said, were like scales and bones. And she actually was one of the first people to recognise what a coprolite actually was. So inside some of the large marine reptiles that she found um, and associated with them, she would often find really strange shaped, basically pebbles that would contain little bits of scale and bone. And she realized that actually this was fossilized poo. So this was associated with those ichthyosaurs, the plesiosaurs, marine reptiles that she was finding. Um, and she was like, ah, oh, hang on. And she recognized that these were coprolites. So it was actually some male scientists that took those ideas from her as well and then published on them. And unfortunately, didn't give her the credit that she uh, deserved for that. Other things that Mary was able to do, um, again, I mentioned because she was from quite a poor background. Um, this was before computers and things as well, or having uh, libraries that she could go to. She would often borrow books from friends and painstakingly write out all the different chapters of the book in order for her to learn. She also um, would often get some of the fish and squids and other things that the fishermen would bring in, and she would dissect them. And that's something that scientists still do today, is that we dissect modern-day animals, and then we compare what we see to the fossils that we've found to help try and identify and understand what we've got there. So she was, one of the, um, she was able to do this and realise that some of these fossil ink, ink sacs, for example, that were actually, these fossils were squids and octopus based on that fossil ink, ink sac. So some of her famous finds, so I've been mentioning ichthyosaurs a lot, so I think that's probably one of her most famous finds. So an ichthyosaur, the name actually means fish lizard, uh, but it's not a fish at all. It's actually a marine reptile, obviously living in the sea. Um, and this is the skull here. So the skull was actually found by her brother Joseph, who was a couple of years older, but it's likely that Mary was there at the about the same time. The following year, when she was just 12 years old, she then went back out and dug out the rest of the ichthyosaur. So at the Natural History Museum in London, we've got the skull and we've got a big string of vertebrae. And that's all uh, material that Mary Anning found and painstakingly learnt to get rid of all of the rock in order to expose the bone. So this was one of the first, um, the first ichthyosaur described in the uh, scientific literature. So it's something that we call a holotype. So that means that if anybody else thinks that they found an ichthyosaur, this is often the fossil that they go back to and basically compare what they think they found. So it's a very important scientific fossil. Uh, so lots of different things, information about ichthyosaurs and the fossils that we found. 
Um, lots of different fossils have come out of Lyme Regis, um, up on the Jurassic Coast um, in Northern England as well. And there have been some ichthyosaurs that we've found, and we knew that they actually gave birth to live young. So they didn't lay eggs, for example. They had live um, birth. So this is a little baby ichthyosaur that was unfortunately, the mum and the baby died, and that's how um, and it became a fossil. So by looking again at that fossil evidence, we can work out how these animals uh, were reproducing and things. Um, another famous find, and this one was a bit controversial at the time, um, is an animal called a plesiosaur. Um, and a plesiosaur uh, had these sort of quite a small um, head, needle-like teeth, big long neck, and sort of a barrel-shaped body with four fins. Now, up until this point, there'd been bits of plesiosaurs found, but nobody knew what they were. Mary Annan was the first person to find a near-complete articulated, so basically all the bones were in the life position, um, fossil. And some scientists thought that she'd faked this. Um, because remember, there was no that people taking pictures and it wasn't so easy to travel around. So it was basically from illustrations. But as more scientists came to look at these fossils, they realised that this fossil was indeed real and she wasn't lying at all. So um, after this point in time, scientists decided um, or basically um, started... Um, realising that Mary Annie actually did know what she was talking about and that she was actually quite clever. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, again, another holotype fossil, a very important scientific fossil there. And again, one of her other famous finds is um, a, a fossil, it's a pterosaur, it's a flying reptile, so it's not a dinosaur. So dinosaurs only walked on land, they were never flying. Um, this is one called Dimorphodon, and this is the fossil um, here. So it looks a bit like a jumble of bones. So it's quite rare that we got all of the bones that fossilise in life position. As I said, when something dies, things often get scattered around. So this is kind of what's happened here. So we knew about, um, people in the world, scientists knew about pterosaurs, but this was the first pterosaur found in the United Kingdom. And dimorphed on this animal here. Again, this was completely new to science. So pterosaurs were flying across the, um, the landscape um, during the Jurassic period. You probably saw them in films like Jurassic World and things. So basically what happened is that their first finger here became really, really long. And then a um, membrane, so skin, evolved from their arm down to their sort of leg that you can um, see, see here. So kind of similar to a bat um, there. In this dimorphodon, it would have had a wingspan of 1.4 metres. So that's from the tip of one arm all the way across to the other. So we call that sort of a medium-sized pterosaur. So they would, would have got much bigger as well. Um, and we think that these animals would have been eating things like um, insects and fish as well. So she made lots of different discoveries. That's literally just um, three. Uh, sometimes she was given the credit at the time. So there was a famous paleoichthologist, so a fossil fish worker, that recognised Anning's, uh, Mary Anning's finds and named a fossilised shark after her. And we've got one of them in the collections at the museum, which is quite special. Um, but often because she was selling the fossils um, to other scientists and other people, her name was lost with a lot of the finds. So even today, we're still finding different um, Mary Anning specimens in museum collections um, all around the world, actually, um, from that. So um, as I said, she was a bit of my idol. So the first time when I went down to Lyme Regis, she can dress, you can dress up as Mary Anning, and I love a bit of dress up. So that's me dressed up as Mary Anning. Um, always really loved, obviously, like um, wearing pink, uh, shark up there and this pose um, I realised looking back I still do today when I'm on holiday like da da um, yeah so my friends like to take uh, the mickey out of me for that um, and then sort of moving on is so as I said um, sort of growing up um, I always was always interested in fossils but obviously I had lots of other interests as well it wasn't just fossils and dinosaurs so um, I used to do ballet I was a ballet teacher I was a professional cheerleader, and I competed at national and international competitions. Um, I love Shaun the Sheep. 
I've got lots of little um, toy Sean the Sheeps and little statues and things um, in my office and at home. Um, love Formula One. I love motor racing. I've been fortunate to um, get to drive some fast cars and do some track days, um, which is pretty cool and exciting. And I've been to a couple of motor, um, Formula One races as well. Uh, love Jensen Button, so that's why I've got the picture up there. Um, but I think also it shows that you, um, often when people say, like, oh, you're a paleontologist, you're then pigeonholed into one thing. And when I've spoken to lots of different people, including children, um, they've sort of said, like, oh, I'm not too sure what I want to do, or um, I do ballet, but my teacher said that I can't do ballet and be a paleontologist. Why not? So this is why I've sort of put this up. And people sort of say, well, why do we still need to have International Women's Day? Why do we need to have representation and things? Um, not just for myself, as I said, a lot of outreach events I do, I get some sort of comment about, you don't look like a paleontologist. Um, you wear too much pink to be a paleontologist. Um, or something along those lines. But what actually really gets me very worked up is even just two months ago, uh, we do sleepovers at the museum and I'd been speaking about fossilised sharks. And there was a girl came up to me with her mum and said that, oh, could you get a picture taken with me? And I was like, oh, yes, very nice. And it was because her teacher at school had told her that um, girls um, can't do fossils. Yeah, fossils aren't for girls. Um, yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Load of rubbish. Um, so, and that's not the first time I've heard it. It's not the second time, and it's not even like the 20th time I've heard that. That even in this day, there are teachers, there are people in authority positions telling children that they can't do something because of either their gender or what they look like or their background, um, or because you like other things as well. Load of nonsense. Um, so she had sparkly trainers on, so like me, and I was like, yes, I still wear sparkly trainers. I'm usually wearing pink. I'm not your stereotypical paleontologist. Let me speak to your teacher. Um, but I am. I've been working as a paleontologist for, um, oh gosh, uh, 15, uh, 17 years now. Um, I work at one of the largest museums in the world. I've travelled the world digging up fossils for a living. So it's a load of nonsense. So I think that's really important that there is still this representation. Um, it's not just me. I'm also standing here on lots of, you know, lots of other colleagues um, and friends that have kind of laid the path for me to be here. And I think it's important that for the future, so lots of future paleontologists here in the audience, adults, it is possible to change careers as well. Um, you know, there is still this opportunity, and I think there's still a lot that we can do in order to help future generations uh, come along. Um, yes, so yeah, do we still need International Women's Day? Yes, yes we do, I think. Um, I also sort of wanted to finish up, because I'm always asked, like, well, where can you find fossils? There's lots of different places that you can go and find fossils. Um, there's a couple of good websites, so um, Rockwatch, um, any children, um, sort of under 18s, so that's a fantastic website, um, aimed specifically at under 18 year olds. And they cover all aspects. So like if you want, if you really like volcanoes, for example, or you like space and meteorites, uh, yeah. <laughs> And there uh, are fossils as well. So there's lots of like information, activities, videos and things like that. And they also sometimes organise different field trips around about the UK. So it's not just based in London, it's based all over. Um, another great website is uh, UK Fossil Collecting. So you can actually put in roughly where you live and it will tell you different areas that you can go to, how easy it is to get there, whether you can get public transport or if you have to you know, perhaps drive and how difficult it is to maybe find some fossils. Um, and yeah, also if you find any fossils, um, there's fantastic museums, such as the one that we're in today as well, and that you can often uh, bring your fossil in, fossils into your finds, and somebody might be able to help you identify them. Um, or there's various online group chats and things on Facebook, for example. So at the Natural History Museum, we've got a couple of online forums, and there's lots of different experts and a fantastic community we've built up that will help you identify different things that you might have found. But it's not just going off to beaches or cliffs or quarries or doing anything like that. You can often find fossils literally right underneath your feet. So, for example, um, the cathedral, uh, there are fossils in the cathedral just across the road. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you don't have to go to far-flung places to find them. So these are some crinoids. 
So these are all being uh, basically um, rocks that's been cut and polished. And these are kind of related to sort of uh, lilies, the starfish. Um, this is from my local shopping centre. So um, I was walking around looking at the floor um, and realised, yes, yeah, so you've got these fossils on the, my local shopping centre floor. So we've got a cephalopod. So this is um, sort of a spiral shaped animal that are related to squid and octopus. Um, this is uh, one of those trace fossils. So this is a burrow and um, this sort of black wiggly line there. And this one is a bellum knight that's again being cut in half. Again, they're related to squid and octopus. And we've got some of those fossils at the side there that you can actually see. So even just walking down the street, have a look at the rock. Often it's um, banks, um, older buildings and things. And you can often find fossils there, literally two minutes um, across from where we, we're all sat here just now. So there's lots of different places you can go and find fossils. You don't always have to travel to far-flung places. Um, yeah, so I think we've got some fossils if anybody um, wants to go up and have a closer look at them. Very happy to answer any questions or anything that anybody has. But yeah, that's it. So thank you. You're welcome. Or if you're too shy to answer, um, put your hand up to ask a question. You can always come and find me later. Oh, yeah. So, um, so sharks have been around for about 420 million years. So that's 200 million years before dinosaurs evolved. They've survived multiple mass extinction events. And over that time period, there's been about 5,000 different species of sharks that's ever existed. Now, some of them have changed quite dramatically. There's been big groups and families that have completely wiped out and gone extinct for a number of different reasons. Um, and some that have sort of survived and gone through. So you're sort of, I guess, stereotypical shark, um, body, for, uh, body form and, you know, with the triangular shaped teeth type thing. That goes back to sort of the Jurassic period. So about 100, uh, 180, 200 million years ago. And this was at a time that sharks, um, up until that point, their upper jaw was fused with the rest of their skull. So our lower jaw is only attached to muscles and tendons, for example. So you wriggle your lower jaw? Yeah? Can you do that with your upper jaw without moving your head? No. Hopefully not. So um, our lower jaw is only attached to muscles and tendons. So sharks, their upper and lower jaw um, is only attached to muscles and tendons. And that's something that evolved during that Jurassic period. Um, it basically means they can extend their jaws out to get a bigger bite of things and more likely to capture their prey. Um, so yeah, they've evolved and adapted over the years. Uh, some sharks went extinct at the time when the dinosaurs all went, um, got wiped out with the asteroid hitting the earth and the subsequent changes in climate that happened after that. But other sharks survived because they lived deep in the oceans and were basically unaffected by that. Um, so overall, a lot of the sharks still look quite similar to, you can go back in the fossil record and still see similar body plans in shape. And a lot of that goes to, if it ain't broke, why fix it, kind of thing. Uh, but there have been other groups of sharks that have gone off, done kind of strange, weird things, and not survived very long. Um, but the prediction is basically, so you mentioned about being, being bigger in the past. Um, yep, that's true. So the biggest shark that's ever lived, I'm sure some people will know it in the audience, called Megalodon. Yep, and the name actually means big tooth, and the, one of the some of the teeth are bigger than my hand. And that lived at a time when it was much cooler in the oceans. So the kind of prediction is, as oceans get hotter in the future because of um, global warming, animals will get smaller. And at the time that Megalodon was around, the oceans were much cooler uh, back then as well. So there's kind of, yeah, a bit of a mixture. So long answer to your question. Uh, yes, some of them did, other ones not quite different. Welcome. Yes. Oh, that's a great question. So with any extinction event, it's very rare that it's just because of one thing. It's of, um, often a number of different factors. So as dinosaurs went up, and we say they were around for millions and millions of years, and actually before they went extinct, they were kind of heading towards that way anyway. Their numbers were reducing. 
But um, there was a big meteorite that hit the Earth um, and that hit in Mexico. And it was huge, this meteorite. And what, um, when it hit, um, crashed into the Earth, lots and lots of um, sediment and dust and other stuff got thrown up into the skies and kind of covered the skies so the sun wasn't able to get through. So some dinosaurs and other animals would have gone extinct right at that time when it happened. Other animals that lived on the other side of the world, it would have taken them a lot longer. So for many millions of years, um, they probably would have, like, um, many th hundreds of thousands of years, they would have staggered on. But eventually they did die out. Um, but a small group of dinosaurs called theropods, so think about, like, Velociraptor, it had feathers and would have been hopping around. And that group of dinosaurs evolved into birds that we have today. So technically, yes, our dinosaurs are still around today. So that pigeon um, that you see out in the road, uh, yeah, basically think of that um, as a Jurassic uh, dinosaur. So what made you become paleontologist? When you started, you know, I know that you said that, you know, growing up, that you, you know, like fossils and you really yeah. enjoy. What was the day that you thought, yeah, that's it, I want to be? So my three ambitions... And when I wanted to be five, you know, you go to school. When I grew up, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a police of, um, officer, you know, whatever it was. I had three. I wanted to be a prima ballerina, <laughs> um, a paleontologist, or to work at McDonald's. I think I just thought I could get to play in the ball pit and eat all the Happy Meals, which, you know, let's be honest, it would be pretty good. But when I was 16 and I wanted a Saturday job, McDonald's didn't want me. <laughs> so I was like, their loss. Um, but yeah, it was just, I, it was in my teens, I had learned that actually the dancing side I really enjoyed as a hobby much more. Um, I was discussing it earlier, I've got like a few sort of old injuries from there. Um, and I just realised that actually the science side of things I really enjoyed much more and having that in quiz, you know, well, why did they do this? What happened? And, and wanting to find out more. So I think it was kind of like in my mid-teens uh, to late teens, I was like, no, actually, paleontology, give it a go. Um, and then getting specialised into museums, um, specifically was when I was sort of in my early um, 20s. So it was kind of like a sort of more of a journey, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So does anybody want my job? It's <laughs> pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> and how long have you been working at the... So I've been working there uh, about 13 years now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> so yeah, some days it feels like I've just been, I've only been there a couple of years, and other days it feels like a lot longer. <laughs> but if I'm having one of those days, as I said, I've got fantastic collections that were found by Charles Darwin, for example, Mary Anning, that I can go and have a look at. And one of the great things I love about my job is that I work with lots of different researchers and other people from all around the world that want to know more about stuff. So I really love the fact that every day I'm learning something new. I don't know everything, and I'm never going to know everything, but I'll learn from each person that comes into the, into the department or every inquiry that I do. And so I have to go off and research it, basically. So it's good. Oh yeah, thank you. So I think we've got some fossilised poo and things over here if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs>